Alrighty, two important notes before we get into the lecture. One is that last week's lecture, last week was kind of a wash in a way. I was sick one of the lecture periods and the other one, the uh, recording software wasn't working. So lecture-wise, video is not available. We will recap that while adding a lot of good stuff, additional stuff to it. So don't feel like you're behind for not having seen it. So we're going to call this one lecture-wise. Well, we're just going to pretend that day didn't happen. It did, but we're going to cover all the good stuff from that lecture and then take it much further. The other thing I want to mention is that my theory is that there are still folks who have no idea what they're going to do for the project. If you are totally at a loss for a project, send me a text or email. So if you're totally at a loss for a project, send me text or email and I will send you a document containing flowcharts and pseudocode for a hangman program. Right, so you could do the hangman project. It's pretty easy to code when you have a flowchart and pseudocode in front of you. Show how to do it. But if you just implement what's in that document, you just implement what's in the document, then you're not going to get full credit, right? But you'll get a lot of credit because there's a couple things missing from the uh, flowchart. One bad thing that's missing is that uh, it doesn't give you a limited number of guesses, right? So you could just guess A through Z to get it, right? You know, it doesn't stop after 10 guesses or something like that. But surely you could figure out how to do that. And so I want you to make it your own program, but you know, it's a really good start for a project. Like I said, if you haven't, heaven forbid, already gotten a good good chunk of work on a project. So you need to add changes beyond what is there in the document to get an A on a project, but it's better than not turning one in. And I do have people turning in projects already or emailing them and asking for suggestions and stuff like that, so I know that a lot of y'all are working on it, so thank you very much. All right, so we've been talking about HTML and CSS leading up to JavaScript programming. Now, the syntax for JavaScript is different than the syntax for Python. It's different than Java. If you've ever taken a Java course, the two things are only related by their name because the inventors of JavaScript thought that, they, uh, that there was a lot of buzz around Java and so that they'd write on the coattails of the name. But what JavaScript does is very, very useful. When your browser loads up an HTML document and everything you see on the screen is an HTML document, you can usually get to it by doing um, right click and doing view source. And if you're using a pretty cool browser, not only can you get a hold of the source, but if you right click on it, you can do inspect. And I'm sure it's different for, you know, Edge or Microsoft um, Internet Explorer or Firefox. But anyways, it shows you all sorts of information about it, not just the source. Here's the source, but it gives you a lot of other information about it too. And if you become a, a CSS and a JavaScript HTML kind of person, then you will get used to using this kind of editor. Now the problem with doing JavaScript and CSS and HTML development is that if you make a mistake, usually it won't tell you. It's not going to tell you there's a syntax error. You're not going to get a red message when you try to run it. Usually it just fails silently. And that's because the browsers are supposed to default back to like the least common denominator, right? You wouldn't want Amazon to not let you buy something just because some idiot put, you know, a mismatched tag on it right, you know, some little minor error. You'd still want the functionality to work. Now maybe the text is in the wrong color or maybe the buttons don't light up when you move your mouse over it, but you want it to work. You want it to fall back to the best that it can do rather than completely fail, which is what syntax errors usually do. But that makes it a little bit hard to debug because it doesn't produce an error message. It just doesn't do the, what you hope it'll do. So as we're typing this code in, you are likely to get to a point where it just doesn't work. 
So what I'm going to try to remember to do is to make backup copies of the steps along the way so that I can just upload those backup copies. And if you get to a certain point and it's just flat out not working and you can't see what's going wrong, then you can go to you know that copy and make changes from there. So I'll try, I'll try real hard to, to remember that. So as we've talked about, an HTML document is what is passed back to the from the server when your browser makes a request, right? If you try to access a you know a web address, the web server software on that machine is gonna you know produce a stream of bytes, which it sends back to you. And those bytes are text, right? It's all this stuff. So if I go to some web page, and then I do right, yeah, let me close that inspector. Right click view page source, I will see some stuff. This stuff here is HTML. Now this one doesn't have hardly any so-called CSS, which stands for Cascading Style Sheets, information involved. It's almost pure HTML. So what do I mean by that? These things are called tags. You have opening tags and closing tags. An opening tag is one that's between angle braces, and a closing tag is the same thing, but it's got a backslash in front uh, of the word. So pretty much, with a very few exceptions, for every opening tag you have, there'll be a closed tag as well. So we have an open HTML tag that indicates that this is an HTML document that a browser is supposed to be able to view, and so we have a closed one. We have a body tag, and so there should be a backslash body. We have a div tag, which stands for division. It's a chunk, it's one part of the code. And we have a slash div. Now notice that we have these BRs, which stands for line break. Those don't have close tags. You could add them, but the browsers just go ahead and accept the fact that most people aren't gonna add a closing tag. And the general rule of thumb is, in effect, if I can make notes to this effect, Every opening tag needs a closing tag. The exception is that if there is no non-tag information required after the tag, it doesn't need a closing tag. Let me make this larger. Still wrestling with the fact that this machine was reformatted. So if we were going to make an HTML document, and like this, all it really did have is a picture in the middle of it, right? Look like this, I had a picture. Ignoring the fact that there's something broken up here and that there's some kind of fancy background, mostly it just has a picture and a link. Well, that would look something like this. It would say HTML, that's a tag. And notice I'm not putting it in its own document, and I probably should. So why don't we go ahead and do that rather than stick it in notes. I'm going to make an HTML document. So file new, file save as, where it says save as type. I'm actually going to use a different editor than Notepad if I can get it to work. So I'm going to launch TextPad. If you don't have TextPad at home, I recommend you go ahead and install it. It's free. So you're going to want to go out to do a Google search on TextPad. TextPad, the text editor for Windows, it's free. Find a download for it, pause the recording, go download it, and then do the rest of the of this work with TextPad. You can get away with using uh, Notepad, but it's, it's much more annoying. Now, I should have TextPad on this machine here. So TextPad. I'm going to do File Save As. TextPad annoys me because it does not default to the right there. Anyways, I'm going to call it uh, LectureW.HTML for lack of a better name, and I'm going to change its type to HTML. The reason why is that TextPad lets you edit Java files and C, C++ files as well, ooh, I misspelled lecture, as well as pure simple text files and HTML files, and it colorizes the text just like our idle editor does, but based on different rules. 
right? Because the rules are different. The Python programming can needs to be colorized different than a web page. Okay, un momento. If you're editing in TextPad, after you choose your document type and you want to change the size of the text, you go into Preferences, you go into Document Classes, you choose HTML, you click that little down arrow and you choose Font. I don't know why they hit it so many layers deep and you choose a larger font. All right, I think I'm happy now. All right, so they all are going to start with HTML. And I try to use tabs. The tabs are completely ignored, unlike Python. But I try to use them to organize the data. And if you're used to doing Java programming or C and C++ programming, well, you're used to doing Python programming. You know that tabs provide good information. And just because they're not necessary doesn't mean, OK. So I'm going to put a header tag, and I'm going to put a close header tag, because we might put in useful in information here. For example, we might be able to put a web title, a title for the web page there. Now, nowadays, titles don't really matter all that much, right? I mean, they're still important, but eventually you load up, you know, 40 or 50 tabs, and you can't hardly read your tabs. Anyways, so HTML title tag, I'm going to look that up. The way that it works, notice what I did is I Googled the name of the tag, and I hit Enter, and usually the first hit, well, okay, add HTML to it. HTML title tag. Usually it'll go to something called W3 schools. Good enough. So we could put a web page title between title tags. So here between my head and my slash head tags, I'm going to do this. Title. And I'm going to put a title. Lecture W. Or maybe just a W. Who knows? You can break them out on separate pages, I mean separate lines like that. But if it's something really simple with only a little bit of text between the two tags, sometimes I put them all on the same line just to be concise, right, like that. One funny thing about HTML is that spacing doesn't matter. It would display the same whether I did this or whether I took those spaces out completely. I'm going to leave it like that for now. OK. And now I'm going to put a body. So angle brace body. I'm going to put this as a web page. But I'm going to put that inside a paragraph tag. So before that text, this is a web page. I'm, after the body, I'm going to put angle P, close angle. And then this is a web page. And then angle slash P, my close tag. I have to close that paragraph. Just to prove a point, I'm going to add some extra text here. This is a web page. It is so cool. All right. Now, I'll show you what that point is in a minute. I need to close my body tag. And I need to close my HTML tag. That's why indenting helps, because you, know, you can just scroll up and go, OK that and that and all of this is inside the body and all of this is inside this paragraph. So you want to save it every time before you view it because if you view it and you haven't saved it it's going to view the old copy of it. So you can type in you know a thousand lines of text and then if you haven't clicked save but you click the view and web browser icon then it'll show the last version of it which is uncool. How do I know it's not saved? There's an asterisk next to the file name. So just as a matter of course, always hit the floppy disk before you hit the, uh, the web browser icon. Or I, if you don't see me do that, it's because I'm hitting Control S, you know, which stands for File Save. And if you're doing this on a Mac, then uh, you can find another web browser, excuse me, another text editor that does the same um, thing as this. You'll just have to uh, just stretch your legs a little bit, get this all to work. All right, view and web browser. Here's my web page. See the name of the web page is W just like I said and it says this is a web page it is so cool notice something about that my page had this is a web page it is so cool on separate lines like I said HTML ignores all the spaces so it just mushes those two things together that's what the paragraph tag is for there's another tag that will help break things up too 
go back to this. It's called the BR tag. If I come here and I do BR, it stands for line break. Now when I run it, not run it, excuse me. Now when I save it, control S and then click the planet. All right, it broke that up into two lines, right? What if I want a blank line between them? I could put two BRs in a row. All right, now there's a blank line between them. BRs are kind of frowned upon, but they're so useful, you know, when you're whipping out mm. stuff like this by hand that, that people tend to use them. You're supposed to kind of always supposed to uh, break things up with paragraphs or div, D-I-V, which breaks things up into sections. Alrighty, so notice that these don't have closing tags. That's because there's nothing required, right? It's just kind of like a single command, and then there's nothing that follows it, right, that has to do with the BR. If you put anything after it, that's just text, right? So it's kind of a self-closing tag. And one way to indicate that something is a self-closing tag is to put a angle brace, excuse me, an angle before your, excuse me, a slash before your closing angle, like that. That makes that a, a self-closing tag. However, it's not necessary. It works just as well without that. And so, since that adds a little bit of visual noise, I tend to leave that off. That's a little bit more strictly correct, but like I said, I tend to leave that off. All right, so along with tags, you also have attributes. We don't have any attributes here yet, but we're gonna. We're going to add an attribute to this paragraph so that all the text inside it is blue. So tags are the things between the braces. And attributes are things that are inside the braces that look like this. Style equals. What style am I going to make it? Well, I'm going to say that the color of the text is red. So color colon red. And I put an extra space there, maybe because that makes it easier to read. You certainly don't have to do that. Now when I view it, all of that text is going to be red because the style attribute has been set. Now everything between the quotes follows what's known as the CSS formatting, the CSS syntax, cascading style sheets. Cascading style sheets let you set the font, the amount of padding around something, the background color, the foreground color, the size of the font, whether it's underlined or not, it's got all that kind of stuff in it. We're only modifying one piece of the style. And why is it called cascading? Because, well, yeah, we'll talk about that later. Well, I'm going to save it, and I'm going to run it, and I'm going to see that the text is red. All righty. Okay, now I'm going to show, uh, this would be a good place to uh, make one of those backup copies I was talking about. Right? Okay, so that's a good place. Keep that going. Okay, what if we wanted everything in our body to be blue? Okay, so we're gonna put another style attribute, but we're gonna assign it to the body tag. So style equals, quote, color colon blue, end quote, end brace. So I'm going to put a couple of paragraphs in here. There's going to be a paragraph here that says, hello, exclamation point, and then backslash P. I'm going to close the tag all on the same line. Do I have to do it that way? No, I could pad it out like this, right? And then I'm going to come and do the same thing. I'm going to add one more paragraph at the bottom. So angle P, close angle, goodbye. 
and then close that tag, angle slash P. If you're used to doing backslashes, like backslash in, no, in HTML it's all forward slashes, the one underneath the question mark. All right, notice that, that style here. We made the entire body red, but oh, by the way, one of the things enclosed in it, excuse me, we made the entire body blue, but oh, this little part of it had red text, but everything else was left blue. That's why it's called cascading, right? This change to make everything blue cascaded to everything inside that tag. Everything inside this body tag was supposed to be blue, but you could override it with tags you know, further down. But those overrides only happen for stuff that's inside that, right? So we changed it red, but the red text only continues between the opening and the closing of that tag. So the idea behind so-called style sheets is that up here in the head, you can declare styles that apply to the entire document as a whole. So I'm going to get rid of this style color is equal to blue. Just going to get rid of that. And I'm going to add a style up here in the head that sets everything to blue, unless overridden by tags like that. So make sure I get this exactly right. Okay, so up here in the head section, I'm going to add a style section. So I'm putting a style tag inside the head. And I'm going to unindent everything. People tend to not, you know, they just tend not to. So I'm going to say, oops that everything that's a paragraph tag is supposed to be color, eh, why not do something else, color green. And I have goofed the formatting for this and I apologize. I'm gonna retype it completely because I goofed it. So, P and an angle brace, color colon green semicolon. That's a semicolon. That's a colon. And then I'm going to close my style tag. Backslash style. And to maybe make the style stand out a little bit, I'm going to unindent that. All right. You'll notice that I'm mixing indentings and unindentings. You just have to pick your own style, and, you know, figure out how you're going to go with it. So now when I save it, I know I need to save it because there's an asterisk up in the name, and then I view it, all the text is going to be green. Because the way we read this is, okay, I'm going to start defining my styles. Every paragraph is supposed to be green. And then later on, oh yeah, we overwrote it down here, but every paragraph is supposed to be green. There's another way you can specify a section of the style and match it to a section of your HTML and that's through ID. So you see this hello tag? Excuse me, this hello text inside this? I'm going to add an ID attribute to this first paragraph and it's going to say ID equals quote hello. end quote. Now I've given this tag an ID so that I can tie this tag with a style that I'm going to define up here that matches that ID. Okay, so here I'm going to do pound sign hello. That means 
the pound sign means that it's going to match an ID and not a tag, right? No pound sign means look for, look for P tags and set them all green. The hash, the pound sign means look for that ID and set it to whatever we're going to do. I feel like doing something different than changing its color. Let's see font size CSS style. Font size CSS style. Go and get a good example of it. So the tag, the excuse me, not the tag. The style setting is font dash size. We can set it with pixels or we can set it with other ways. So I'm going to do font dash size colon and I'm going to set the font size to some large number of pixels, like 40 px. I'm just curious what that's going to look like. All right, so that's not the only way to do it. You can also do it with whatever EMs are. If you're a type designer, you know that means something. You can do it. All righty. Here's an interesting one. Font dash weight to make something bold. Let's use size rather than weight, though. Okay, so coming here, after my pound sign hello, I'm going to make the font dash size colon. 40 px, 40 pixels. And you're supposed to put semicolons after the end of it, before the closing brace. Often you can get away without doing that, but I want to teach you all the, the good ways of doing things. You absolutely have to use semicolons if you're putting multiple, multiple styles inside the same specification. Like, I'm going to erase this, but if I, well, maybe I won't. What if I went here and I said every paragraph is supposed to be green and it's supposed to have a font dash size of colon 20 pixels. You see that semicolon there? That separates these two things. So all the paragraphs are supposed to be green. Also, they're all supposed to be 20 pixels. However, this one's going to show up as red, but nothing's going to change its font size, so it's still going to be 20 pixels. But this one's got an ID that matches this style. And so it's going to be larger. Control S to save it, plan it to view it. There. So that one came out as being larger. That's the idea behind styles. Styles are often actually located in a completely different document on the web server than in, in the uh, than in the HTML file. And as a matter of fact, the HTML usually is not a file at all. It's something that's ge generated programmatically by the web server, by some software running on the web server. And one of our very la <laughs> last lectures is going to be writing something that generates a web page using Python as a web server. Normally you do not use Python as a web server, so this is just a, a, a learning exercise, you know. You can be sure that IBM doesn't have web servers that are, you know, Python as a web server. You can use Python to generate the web pages that's called from the web server. Anyways, this would be another good point to make our backup copy for the notes. So if you're stuck, We'll look at the notes. There's our next one. All right. A couple more important tags. Links and images. We're going to do a link first. It's called the anchor tag, actually. A space href is the tag. So down here, maybe underneath all of my other stuff, underneath goodbye, maybe inside its own paragraph, so angle brace P, this is right before the closing body tag. Angle A space href equals, and we're going to go to www.google.com. Close brace. But then what is the name of that tag supposed to be? Not the name of the tag. What text do we want? to show up on the screen that they click on because, you know, just because there's something up here that you can click on and it takes you to a different web page, it's not the whole address, right? If, if I'm looking at uh, Rose's web page here and I have a link here, if 
Behind the scenes, that's a web address. And we can see down here at the very bottom of the browser, that full web address. Well, that's huge. But this is just a text that's displayed that links to that web address down there. So what's the text that we're going to say? And we're going to put something dumb. Time to search. And then we have to close our A tag, our anchor tag, slash A. Now, really, these should be fully qualified URLs. URL stands for Uniform Resource Locator. It's the web addresses. So I'm going to put HTTP colon backslash, whoopsie, backslash, backslash, just, just because that's what you would see up here, right? Except I put the slashes the wrong way. They'll work either way, but I want to do it the right way, so they're going to be made forward forward slashes. There we go. So control us to save it, plan it to view it, and there's my link. Let's also note that uh, href stands for hypertext reference. Hypertext existed before the internet. It was invented in the 60s and the 70s, and it's a way of formatting documents on computers so that you have a link that if you click on something, it goes to a different location in the text or a different location in another file. Uh, hypertext reference. That's what the HT and HTTPS stands for as well, hypertext. HTML, hypertext markup language. So how about a picture? We need to put a picture on here. I'm going to download a few pictures. I'm going to just go to Google. I'm going to download a few pictures. I'm going to look for kitties or puppies. I'm going to type in puppy. I'm going to find some pictures. Alrighty, here's a cute puppy. I'm going to right click on him and do save image as. I hope your browser has the same options. I don't like the fact that it's saying JFIF there. That's kind of disturbing me. I'm going to look for a different one. Save image as. It's still saying JFIF. It'll probably work. But Google has uh, made some kind of change here so that these are being... Alright, so I'm going to actually click on the thing to expand it and then right click on it and do save as and now it says jpg i like that better but i'm going to change its name as i download it and i want it to be in my scripting directory this needs to be in the same directory as the html file itself so i'm going to go and put it in my scripting directory <laughs> you can't tell it's my scripting directory because i've lost my scripting directory but just roll with it all right and so i'm going to call this one puppy1.jpg if it said something else other than .jpg, like it said PNG, call it puppy1.png. Or if it's a GIF, G-I-F, believe it or not, you're supposed to pronounce it GIF, even though, you know, graphic interchange file, GIF. Anyways, GIF, GIF, whatever. You would call it puppy1.gif. All right, now I'm going to add a tag, an image tag, so that I can see the puppy. So now that I've saved my image, Oh, see here, I made a mistake. I forgot to close my paragraph tag. But it viewed okay. The browsers try their best to render the HTML. Meaning that if, you, if there are some missing closing tags, it goes ahead and, and tries to figure out. It found this closing tag and it decided that, well, it, it, there had better been a closing tag for the thing above it as well. All right, so let's do this. IMG. SRC, and if I was reading this to you and not using the letters, I'd say image source equals. But IMG space SRC equals, quote, puppy1.jpg, or whatever you called yours. Now, this is a self-closing tag, just like BR is. So I'm not going to put a close image tag. If I feel like, you know, dotting every I and crossing every T, I could make it a self indicate that it's a self-closing tag by doing that. So I have control us to save it, hit the planet to view it, and there's my dog. Well, that sure is large. What if I don't want it to be so large? Resize the image. Exactly. Well, I could resize it with an editor, but I can also add an attribute that resizes it. Here's one way to do it, I think. 
without using cascading style sheets, just by using another attribute. The only attribute we've really used so far is this style attribute, and then here we used another attribute, href, and we did source. I believe we could do this, size equals, I don't know what it's gonna do. Let's find out. Size equals 400. I don't think this is the correct way of doing it. I'm pretty sure it's not, but I'm gonna give it a shot. Did I forget to save it? That's my usual trick. Nope, that didn't work. Okay, so I'm gonna find the uh, image size style CSS. Go figure that out. Ah, they, they don't use size, they use height and width. My mistake. Okay, so go and delete that size. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna say height, has to be spelled exactly correct, so H, E, now I'm just gonna do the width. W-I-D-T-H equals quote 100 PX, which stands for 100 pixels. If you left off the PX, it would default to being pixels anyways. And there's my doggy, except he's really small. 100 pixels is too small, I'm gonna make it 400. All right, I'm happy. Now, none of this involves anything that wasn't invented in 1995, except for the style sheets up here at the top. You used to change the color with different tags. You used to do things, and don't type this because I'm going to undelete it. Color equals quote yellow. And then backslash. In fact, it's probably font space color equals yellow. And then parentheses backslash font. I don't even know if that's worked. You're not supposed to set the colors that way, but it worked, it worked. You're supposed to use styles nowadays rather than using the font tag. It has been so-called deprecated. Deprecated means it still exists, it still works, but it's not recommended. Oh, see how bad I messed this up? I forgot to close my tag and yet it seemed to work. I forgot to do that and it seemed to work. Did it really? No, it just... It didn't work. I needed to close that tag to get it to work. And I told you not to type it in the first place, so I'm gonna undo all that. But you can see that it, it did colorize that as yellow. But you're supposed to do it through style commands instead. Why? Because it puts all the, uh, the information in one place. Typically what happens is you have an HTML expert who goes and designs the web page itself, meaning all the content of the web page, and then you have a graphic designer skilled person who comes in and puts all the styles and organizes it correctly. And those things are supposed to be separated because nowadays things may be viewed on a phone, they may be viewed on a big screen, they may be viewed on an iPad, right? All sorts of different viewing things. And you want the same content to work regardless of whether they're viewing it on a phone or whatever, but they, sometimes they need to be changed depending upon whether it's being viewed on a phone or you know a landscape monitor like this. You would want all of this to be exactly the same, but the style sheet to change based on what device they are using. So you would provide different styles based on whether they're using a phone or whether they're using, you know. So by training yourself not to add size information and color information and stuff like that down here, then you're, do, you're developing better content, easier to maintain. Now for this, you know, for whipping out, you know, a web page in, in five minutes to upload to something, you know, and it's going to be simple and stuff like that, there's nothing wrong with what we're doing. Okay, so I deleted that font tag. One thing to note is that this is not interactive, meaning that there's, other than the link that'll take us to the next page, right, nothing else can happen. There's no buttons to click, nothing lights up when I move my cursor over it. It's not interactive. It's not programmed to do anything. It's just kind of a static web page, meaning it doesn't change. That's the way stuff was in 1995. The only additional thing you had is that they did add some form fields, right? So you could type in your name and then a submit button, right? You had that kind of stuff back then. but. As soon as you click that submit button, it went to the web server and it downloaded an entirely new web page. And imagine doing that over like a 9600 baud modem like you had in the mid-90s. That's incredibly slow compared to today's cable modems and phones and stuff like that. 
And it doesn't make the web page interactive. It means that when you click the button, the whole thing blanks out. It waits for the web server to kick out a new web page, and then it loads it again. So that's not really interactive. This is a static web page, and we might want to add some interactivity. So like, we might want to add a button that, when clicked, it changes this picture to something else. Is this a good point to uh, do the uh, backup copy? Have I added enough to warrant that? Sure, why not? Better safe than sorry. So in order to trigger the JavaScript, we have to have something that is clickable on screen, like a link or a button. So we may as well add a button. I'm going to put a button up at the very top of it because I'm tired of adding things at the bottom of it. I'm going to come up here of above my hello tag after the body tag, and I'm going to do button, angle, brace, button, end of brace. What is it? Type equals quote button. That implies that there's more than one type of button, right? Well, there's also check boxes and things like that. And then what's it supposed to do when it's clicked? Well, we'll figure that out later. I'm just going to do on click equals quote quote. And then what's the text of the button supposed to say? Click me exclamation point. Slash button. Now that's going to display a button, but it's not going to do anything, right? This on click doesn't do anything. So when I view it, there's a button up here, and I, I botched it. That, that looks bad. I need to go and figure out what my mistake is. Oh, I closed the tag. These are all attributes of the tag, so I should not have that closing thing there. So button and a no angle brace. You can still put it on, eat everything on its own line, which is how I'm going to do it after I make sure that it looks correct. That is how it ought to look. Now, typically, I line these up kind of like that, right? But it does, like I said, formatting and spacing does not matter. So button, type equals quote, button, end quote. And then on click is equal to quote, quote. And then a closing brace. Maybe I will put all that on one line. And then this is encased inside the, the pair of tags, right? The opening and the closing tag. Mm -hmm. Click me. Did I forget to save it? Yes, I did. There's the asterisk C. Be neat if it saved it automatically when you click that, but nope, that's not how this rolls. Do that again. Click me. Okay, great. It doesn't do anything. Well, we need to add some JavaScript. We need to make it do something. When it's clicked, the JavaScript is the programming that makes the web pages interactive. You know, like web pages are incredibly interactive anymore, right? If you go to eBay, you know, it's got pull down menus, it's got things that light up or underline as they go over. You don't want it to have to load up a new web page every time you click something because loading from the web is the slowest thing, right? That's when that pops the wheel up and you know the wheel is spinning and you're sitting there waiting forever for something to happen. So everything should happen on the client side as much as possible and that's what JavaScript does. So when I clicked on this thing to shop by categories, it displays all this stuff and it did it instantly. It did not go back to the web server and ask for all this stuff, right? It did not reload it. It just changed what is being displayed. And so if we go and we look at the view page source, we will see that eBay's JavaScript is incredibly long. And you can be sure that it's not just one file that's there. It's, it's built from a collection of files and that the web server software can, you know, can loads all those files in and then it passes back an HTML document, which has got all this stuff. That's called server-side programming. 
let's make this button do something. So on the on click, we're going to put a little bit of JavaScript. Very, very little. Now here's where our typing is going to... How about a JavaScript for displaying a pop-up message so that when something is clicked, it just pops up a little message. And we all hate pop-up messages, but we're going to do it. Uh, so JavaScript pop-up text. There's something called an alert box. That's the simplest one. Then you can also have a confirm box, which will have an OK and a cancel button. And then a prompt box, which lets them type in some stuff. We're going to use the simplest one, which is the alert box. So inside the on click, and I'm going to, unfortunately, my memory is so short that I'm going to have to go back and look at it. Window.alert parentheses, quote, awesome, end quote. Now I've got a problem here. Close parentheses. And my problem is, is that I'm using double quotes both here and here, and they're kind of nested. So I need to decide whether I'm going to put the single quotes, the apostrophes, on the outside of the inside, because otherwise it's treating all of this as one string, right? So I think I'm going to use single quotes on the outside of the on click like that. I'm going to make that an apostrophe there and then an apostrophe right before the closing brace. And the colorizing of the text makes that a little bit better. Let me make sure that I absolutely have this right. So I'm going to do one more Google search and I'm going to Google on click window alert because I just want to see an example. I might be able to leave off the window dot, so I'm just going to put alert. And I'm going to add some spaces to make it a little bit easier to read. You certainly don't have to do that. Now, if I play my cards right, when I run it, when I click that button, it's going to pop up a little window that says awesome. Click me. This page says awesome. Well, cool deal. Now, what if I make a single mistake? Like I misspell alert. And then I control S to save it, and I click the planet to run it. Click me. You see, it doesn't do anything. Nothing at all. Do you remember in the old days you'd get little warnings down here in Internet Explorer or, you know? Netscape would say, you know, a JavaScript error was encountered and blah, blah, blah. Well, nowadays they don't display anything. You have no idea that there was a bug there. That, that can make these things difficult to debug, which is why I'm making copies, backup copies to paste in, in the notes at, at, you know, each major change we make. I'm going to go and fix that, and then I'm going to pause the recording and make sure everybody is doing okay here. Let's make a copy of all this stuff. Never know where to leave it. Well, all right. There's the head. If you need to type it all the head from there to there. And here's the body. And I'm going to scroll down so that only the body is showing. And you can go to the notes to grab the head if you need it. Is that really impressive for interactivity? No. It'd be more awesome if we were able to make it actually change what is being displayed. Like maybe we want to change which puppy we're showing. I might go and download a different puppy and call it Puppy 2 and have it change that. But firstly, what we're going to do is we're going to show where you typically put your JavaScript. Typically, you don't put your JavaScript right there because what if it, that was 30 lines of code that needed to be there? Would we want that intermixed with all of our HTML? No, we'd want it up here in the head. So we're going to start adding some JavaScript functions up here in our header section. So here, uh, after head, before the style, it doesn't matter, it could go after the style as well, do script. 
angle script angle. And we're going to define a function. Function f1. Function f1 parentheses in parentheses. Now this language doesn't put colons after everything to show that you're indenting stuff. Instead it uses curly braces like C, C++, and Java. So I'm going to go to the next line and I'm going to put a curly brace, which is a shift of the square, right? Okay. And what I want this program to do, I want it to say alert, <coughs> parentheses, quote, so cool, exclamation point, end, parentheses, end, quote, end, parentheses, semicolon, and then close brace. Now I have this script tag, that means that everything after this script tag is a, considered a script, so in order to make it know that we're done scripting, I'm going to do a close script tag, angle slash script. And I'm going to use some spaces to make this a little bit easier to read. At this point it's kind of bugging me that I have some of this stuff indented and some not, but well, maybe I'll fix that. Maybe I want to take the time to do that. I don't know if that makes it look better or worse. As usual, all I did is I highlighted a bunch of stuff and then hit the tab key. All right, now I wrote a function called f1, but I don't have anything calling it. So I'm going to go down and I'm going to modify my button to instead of calling alert, it's going to call f1. So down here where it says on click is equal to alert, I'm going to delete all that stuff right there. And between the two apostrophes, I'm going to put f1, parentheses, in parentheses. That means call the f1 function. In this particular language, when you start a function, you don't put def. You use the word function. Now, if I haven't made an, an error, when I click on the button, it's supposed to say, so cool. All right, cool. I'm going to add a second button that does something else. Like maybe it changes that hello to something else. We click it and it's going to say, you know, howdy, something like that. So I want a second button. That's the easiest way of making a new button. I'm just going to copy this one. I'm going to copy those lines of code. Button type is equal to button, all that stuff. I'm going to paste it and I'm going to make changes. So this one's going to say click me too. And it's going to call a different script. It's going to call F2. And we're really going to get to the point now where typos are likely because we're going to be mixing uppercase and lowercase very specifically. So I hope I get it right and I hope you get it right. Let's go write a script called F2 because right now, right, there is no script F2. So if I click, click me too, doesn't do anything. So I'm going to add a function. Function F2, parentheses in parentheses, close brace, open cl brace, close, open curly brace, close curly brace. Okay, now this is going to be several lines of code. And like I said, the case is going to have to be exactly correct. So I'm going to say data space equals space document all lowercase dot. Now I'm going to type get element by ID and I'm going to capitalize element by an I in, in D. So get, G-E-T, cap element cap B Y cap I lowercase d. So get capital E L E M N D capital B lowercase y capital I lowercase d parentheses 
quote, and we only have one thing that has an ID, right? What's the one element on our page so far that has an ID? What is the ID of it? Yeah, it's hello. So we're going to look up. We're going to find the object called hello. And now we're going to change it. We're going to blow away what is ever is inside that tag. And we're going to say data dot, and this is all lowercase until I get to the word HTML. And all the, uh, the letters HT, M, and L are going to be capitalized. So data dot enter, like inner tube, I-N-N-E-R, and in all caps, HTML equals, and we wanted to say something different. No longer going to say hello anymore. We're going to make it say howdy. All right, so I have my function. I hope there's no typos in it. I have the button down here that calls that function. I'm going to do some collapsing of my stuff so I can get more stuff on the screen at the same time. In fact, I'm going to delete the title tags and... No, I better not do that. If I go too wacky, then it'll be hard to follow. All right. Can I get function 2 on the screen now? All right. And just know that there's a script tag up there above it. So that's our new function. And this is the button that calls it. Cross our fingers and our toes. Control S, just click the planet. We say click me, it prints a message. We play, say click me too, and it changes it to howdy. It actually modified the way that our document looks. What's happening here is a browser has the entire web page stored in something called the document object model, which gets abbreviated DOM. And so the DOM is this big memory structure that's got all this information and all the tags and stuff like that. And we just told it to go and find the part of the DOM that had that tag, that ID, and replace it with howdy. So it's like it went down here and changed this hello right there to say howdy. go further, I need to go back to our PowerPoint. And this will be the first time that the people watching the videos have seen the PowerPoint. We're going to jump through. The, the PowerPoint is actually very, very long, and I'm not expecting you to read the whole thing. Read the beginning of it, and then tab through, and then get to where I'm looking here. all my documents again. Neat. All right. You see what I mean about uh, page titles becoming useless? Yeah, you can see them if you hover your cursor over it. So I'm going to go to content. I don't mind doing this anyways. Remind everybody where these particular ones are. And then in contents, there is inside the notes folder, there is JavaScript PowerPoints. So the first one is a really good overview of tags and what all the tags mean. And it's all 223 pages long, so yeah, it would take you a while to read. The second one is our JavaScript PowerPoint.
So what is JavaScript? Programming language designed for web pages. It enhances web pages with interactive features so that the web page can change based on what you're doing. And so everything that happens on a web page, right? You click on it, you draw, you drag your finger across it, you know, you zoom in on it. There's JavaScript to handle all that stuff. And so all that stuff runs on the client, meaning it, it runs on the device you're looking at. It doesn't change the way that the server is behaving. It changes the document object model that the browser has got in its brain that it displays. So JavaScript is very case sensitive. So document.write, hello world, that has to all be lowercase, and if we made any part of that uppercase, it wouldn't work. Just like in every other language, certain terms are reserved. So properties are attributes of an object. Now, we've talked about objects, but only a little bit when we were creating classes, right? We could create an object from a class. Like if we want to change the color of the web page, there's a property of the web page called BG color. Now, it's very possible that we could just go in to our code here and make it that when we click a button, we change the BG color. I'm curious if that's going to work, if it's that easy. So I'm going to go back to my web page here. And when we click so cool, I'm going to also do this. Document.bgcolor equals quote yellow. Now that's going to look nasty, and I'm probably not going to really want to keep that, but this is just to prove a point. Control S. And when I click click me, click me too, it did not change it. It was not that easy. All right, so let's get rid of that. But once you have something, once you have an object, then you set the properties of it just like this. Enter HTML is a property of the data object. The data object was returned by the get element by ID method, just like we were writing methods that were functions attached to classes. Well, here we have a class, an object called document, and it's got some methods, a whole bunch of methods, including this one, get element by ID. And so then there are methods. The methods are the functions. So you call them just by putting the parentheses, you know, the variable name, dot, function name, method name, and then any uh, parameters that it takes. And document is the object, and write is the method. Events are things that associate the objects with actions. For example, on click. On click is an event. There's another one, an event called on mouse over. Let's see if we can make a on mouse over event that will change that thing to say howdy just when we move our cursor over it without even clicking on it. So I'm going to go down to this paragraph here that has the word hello in it. And I'm going to add an on mouse over event to it. On mouse over equals apostrophe F2 parentheses in parentheses end apostrophe. I also could have used double quotes. I'm going to split back to the PowerPoint, make sure that I have the uh, spelling of that property correctly, the caps of it. Nope, it's supposed to be a lowercase o. So, on mouse over, the only cap is an M. Mouse over is the event that gets triggered when your cursor moves over. I don't remember if I saved it. Control S, view it again. There. Did you see it change? Now, we might have thought that it was only supposed to change as it actually moved over the green part of it. I'm going to click reload. Instead, anywhere in this entire paragraph is causing it to trigger that event. So maybe I want it to be specifically limited only to that little bit of text. So I'm going to use a span tag. 
What span does is it says we're going to mark off a little bit of our HTML here, but it's not an entire paragraph. So you see where I have this on mouse over business? I'm just going to cut all of that out so that it looks exactly like it did before. So now it says angle P space ID is equal to hello, end angle, and then our text. But before our text, we're going to put a span keyword there. So before the word hello, I'm going to do angle span space on mouse over equals apostrophe F2 parentheses in parentheses. And I should put semicolons here. I think I've been forgetting to do that, but semicolons are correct. Semicolon, close apostrophe, close angle. And since I have an open span tag here, I need to put a close span tag as well. So after the word hello, I'm going to close that tag. Angle slash span in angle. So now my mouse can move much closer to it before it triggers that event. So now we have two events going on here. We have an on-click event. Well, actually, we have you know two on-clicks waiting for those clicks to happen, and we have an on-mouse over event. It's about time to end. So the functions and the name statements that perform tasks. We know how to define them with the function keyword. We give a function name. We have parentheses. There may be parameters listed between the parentheses. And then we put our code between the angle braces. JavaScript has built-in functions, and it comes. We can write our own. All right, that is a good place to stop, so let's stop there. And let me copy all this as our final place in the notes. So if you can't get it to work, at least load these individual things up, run them and test them and understand them. All right, go ahead and upload this stuff into the W Dropbox. And for those of y'all who already have something in the W Dropbox, doesn't matter, just upload something else. Put two things in there, it's all good.